What up artists? My name is Dwayne Jones. I'm the creative director and founder of a lifestyle brand called Art Pays Me. This is the Art Pays Me podcast and I'm passionate about finding ways that people like you and me can make a living for ourselves off of our creativity and you know maybe we can make the world a better place at the same time. Let's get into it. Welcome to the first episode of the Art Pays Me podcast. I'm excited to do this. So before I really want to get into the show, uh, I think it's important that you actually know who the host is. So my name is Dwayne Jones. I live in Halifax, Nova Scotia. That's in Canada. But I was born and raised on the island of Bermuda. And I still really identify as an island boy. And that is a huge part of my identity. I was a kind of a quiet kid. I drew a lot. Um, I was into martial arts, begged my parents to, to get me to join a martial arts school. Finally, at about the age of nine or ten, they put me in kung fu and I just became a nerd about it, um, read about it, trained in it, all that kind of stuff. It was interesting because martial arts was the first thing outside of fine art that I was willing to put that much effort into and I'd later discover a passion for basketball that was similar to that. I also remember being really interested in money as a kid. To make money my brother and I used to have a paper route and then later I got a job in a hardware store I was really interested in saving money. I, I got a real rush out of uh, being able to save up for that, that new Nintendo game. And so I've always had an interest in money, but I never considered myself uh, strong in math. So when I went into high school, I, you know, when I started thinking about what I wanted to do for a living, an accountant was actually what I was interested in being. But turns out accounting classes are very difficult. And uh, <laughs> I was failing accounting. And at my school, they had these kind of very high academic standards. So if you weren't meeting this certain standard, they wouldn't allow you to take the course anymore. So, you know, I was left with, well, I have decent grades in English. I my grades suck in math, they suck in accounting, which is what I actually want to do. But I love art. I've always been good at art. My grades are excellent in art. And everything else, science was like, yeah, interesting, but not great. So by default, for me not having anything else to really go for, I got kind of pushed back into focusing my energy on art. And um, so... From there, I started to just, I didn't have no, I, my, my whole idea of what I wanted to do for a living was kind of shattered. And to be honest, um, I think I became really disillusioned and frustrated in high school. I actually came close to not graduating. Uh, people are surprised to hear that sometimes. Uh, I got in a fight at the end and there was, there was a lot there. But interestingly enough... My high school art teacher, Mr. Stovel, shout out to Mr. Stovel, he recognized that I had this, something about my, my artistic style, he thought it had a graphic nature to it. So he suggested that I pursue graphic design as a career. I had no idea what graphic design was. And I was one of those traditionalists back then who was like anti-computer and anti-digital this and anti-digital that. I thought like real artists only created images by hand, but I had no other options. So I was like, you know what? I don't know what this graphic design thing is, but it's, I guess it's interesting. It's better than anything else that I could do. So uh, I, I graduated from high school. The next step for me was to go to Bermuda College, which is kind of like a two-year community college school in Bermuda get my associate's degree, and then from there it was like I go to the States or Canada or the UK for a university to get a bachelor's degree. Uh, So while at Bermuda College, I started to learn about 
bits about graphic design. We had a Photoshop course. We had some core design classes. I learned about color theory. I started to study art history. And my grades overall started to come up. Even classes that I had traditionally struggled in in high school, I started to do well in at Bermuda College. So I kind of realized something while there is that um, when a person is actually doing something that they're interested in and passionate about, it's not necessarily what the skill is. <sighs> I'm not wording that right. When you're passionate about something, you find a way to help yourself learn better, I guess you could say. So a lot of times I thought I had some kind of learning challenge. and Maybe I did, maybe I do. But because I was so interested in the subject matter... I found ways to absorb that information more effectively. And I started to really excel. And we had a wide range of art type of study at Bermuda College. So I did painting, I did drawing, I did figures drawing, uh, and a lot of theoretical stuff, which um, laid a good foundation for me as a creative person. And it really got me thinking about art as a, a more, um, not just an, an aesthetic practice, but like a, a I don't know, a, a, a scientific practice almost. And while I was at Bermuda College, trying to figure out, you know, what my next step was going to be, I had started exhibiting art, I actually sold my first and only painting for almost a thousand dollars US and I was like blown away that this was something that was even possible. I put it in the show on a whim and someone from the States came in and was like, I want that. So I was like, damn, okay. <laughs> um, and that kind of opened my eyes up to the potential of art as well. Uh, but you know, I still was, you know, was young and floundering a bit and my main goal was, where am I going to go to university? So my color theory and art history teacher, uh, Dr. Zool, he suggested the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. My design teacher, Dr. S Mr. Smith, he's doctor now, um, he suggested Savannah College of Art and Design. That's where he went. So I applied to both, and I also applied for... Uh, University of Toronto, I believe. No, OCAD, Ontario College of Art and Design. Uh, because, you know, we had, you know, I grew up in Bermuda, but we had Canadian and American TV. I used to watch much music, and I was like, yo, I want to go to Toronto and dance with those girls on Electric Circus and all that stuff. So um, I applied for OCAD just <laughs> for that stupid-ass reason. Um, NASCAD turned out to be the only one that got back to me. So I was like, all right, cool. I guess NASCAD it is. So I ended up in Nova Scotia, at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. Uh, because I had such a good foundation um, from Bermuda College, I didn't have to do the foundation year at NASCAD. So I got right into the graphic design program and kind of was in there full steam ahead. Started to it was a bit of culture shock, to be honest. Uh, I had grown up in a country that was mostly black. Now I was surrounded by mostly white people who dressed differently, talked differently, acted differently. Uh, and it was, it was interesting. It was challenging, but I was excited to take it on. Um, and uh, I also learned that as dope as I thought I was, like everybody around me was dope. It wasn't just, I, I didn't go, for, you know, I went from being like one of the best drawers or best creative thinkers or whatever in my school to like now being surrounded by all kinds of people who could operate at a high level or higher level. And uh, having an athletic background, like I mentioned, I trained in martial arts and also I got into basketball like in high school. I kind of said, OK, cool. Challenge. Challenge accepted. So I stepped into NASCAD and decided to to take my take it on and say I'm gonna get myself as 
as good as I possibly can. And uh, while I was there, uh, you start to, there's this interesting thing that happens is that art and design become sort of the most important professions in the world. And you, you don't realize <laughs> that that only really seems to happen within that universe. Another interesting thing that happened when I was at NASCAD was there was this big distinction between the fine artists and the designers. And I was interested in both, so I took a lot of drawing classes when I was at NASCAD, but I was also in the design program, so I was deeply rooted in that. And I would hear the conversations, both sides, uh, slagging the other. And a lot of the, you know, this is, and this is my personal experience. So if you went to NASCAD and you had a different one, please, you know, no offense or whatever. But I noticed that on the fine art side, they were critical of the design side for being uh, like almost not authentic enough, I suppose, almost like selling out and then on the other side at the design side there was this perception that the fine artists were not realistic enough and not practical enough and were going to end up on the street broke and I kind of fell in the middle because I could see the perspective of both sides and I kind of agreed with both sides in a way so I was kind of hedging my bets by doing both <laughs> uh but then eventually, I think I got more indoctrinated into the design side. I mean, that being where my degree was. And I started to turn my nose up at the prospect of being a fine artist and stopped actually practicing my art and just focused on becoming the best designer that I could. So when I graduated from NASCAD, my goal was to work for a, a design agency or an advertising agency, something on on that side where I could be with a team of elite creative designers and um, really get into working with like amazing clients and you know having my work up on billboards I don't even really know what my real goal was I think it was just at that point I just wanted people to know that I was an amazing designer I uh, hadn't really thought much beyond that <laughs> um, Lo and behold, that wasn't as easy as it turned out. I thought I was a lot better than I was, I guess, because agencies weren't that interested in me. But luckily, I found a job um, with this startup. I was, I was at NASCAD looking around. I was like, man, what am I going to do? And there was this flyer on the bulletin board. And it said that there was a magazine looking for a graphic designer. So I said, all right, let me look into that. Uh, called the number. Turned out it was this one dude who was like, he called me in for an interview. We sat down in a coffee shop. He said that he had this magazine, this idea that he had seen in his home country of Israel. And it was pocket size and focused a lot on knife, nightlife and youth culture. And I was like, I'm in. And he was like, okay, you're hired. And I was his first employee. Uh, and I ended up being able to make up my own position. So I was like, well, I'll be the art director. <laughs> so fresh out of school, I had this I had this art director position. I had pretty much complete creative control over the magazine. Um, and uh, it was it was an incredible experience. It was challenging. Uh, there was a lot of I learned I learned some lessons uh, from that. Some some that some there were some positive experiences and some not so positive. Put it that way. But I'd say the biggest thing that I learned was watching the owner of this company uh, be able to take an idea of his that was just on paper at one point and then finding the tools, one of them being me and um, getting, putting them together to make it into a real thing, something that actually generated income and revenue. And it let me kind of realize that the idea of owning a business and entrepreneurship was not as scary as I probably thought it was. 
So one thing I left out is that when I was at NASCAD, they had this business course, and I thought it was the biggest waste of time. I didn't want to do it. Um, and I think a lot of people viewed it that way. So I just did, you know, the bare minimum just so I could pass. But the reality is when you're someone like us, when you have a creative skill, you may not be guaranteed that agency job as I wasn't. I got lucky because I found the magazine job. But what I learned is that a lot of people who graduated with me end up falling out of the creative industry altogether because they can't find work. So they end up taking on other jobs, working in coffee shops, wherever they can. And, you know, sometimes that's too much for them. And they just lose all interest in being an artist anymore. And their life takes a completely different path. So, but the thing is, if they had some business skills, then maybe they would be able to learn how to flip their creative skills into something that could generate some income for them. So this is, that was sort of an eye opener for me, not as much as I thought it would be. I was still way more interested in being an employee because I could see how much work went into um, doing what he did, but it got my mind sort of working. And then, you know, as that time ended with, with the magazine, the magazine eventually didn't work out. It folded. Um, I got a job with duly noted stationery, uh, like a wedding invitation company, and I designed their magazines there. And that was owned by, uh, again, it was another small business, and I sort of got to talk to the owners of quite a bit and see some of the challenges that they had and learn some things from them. Uh, and then eventually I needed something more sturdy and I ended up at Dalhousie University doing graphic design, which <laughs> for me, I'm not going to lie. When I think about the cool image of the agency life that I was trying to have, working at a place like Dalhousie University wasn't quite what I had in mind. Uh, but it ended up being a really smart decision. And I still work there today. It's actually, it's been 12 years now. And uh, so I got there, the work was not really what I was interested in per se, but you know, while I was there, I had started a business kind of before then as a graphic designer consultant and was sort of being able to just be my more creative, authentic self on the side. Um, and so while I was there, you know, I did get frustrated with the the regular work that I was doing, I'd say. I was looking for something else. You know, I had been freelancing on the side. That wasn't super creative either. And I saw, I was, you know, this was the time Gary V and all those type of people were popular. I was following people like... Uh, James White from Signal Noise and seeing him just being completely creative and him building his brand from, you know, from nothing really. And uh, it was just an interesting time. And like a lot of people, Jessica Hish, like a lot of those people who were just starting to make names for themselves as designers and creators. And I wanted the same thing. Uh, but I was so lost about how I was going to do that. I started um, digging back into my fine art roots, tried to paint a bit, I tried to, I was making prints, I was looking into sewing, I was, I was just exploring. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to do something more creative than what I was currently doing. Uh, I even started to write quite a bit. I was interviewing uh, artists for uh, a magazine in, in Texas and I was interviewing people for something in Bermuda. I was doing all kinds of manner of creative exploration. Uh, and then one one day, I, I noticed a pattern. I was, two things, I was reading a lot of music blogs, hip-hop specifically, and then I started to read 
uh, like hype beast and high snobiety and a lot of that stuff, which was a lot to do with street fashion and streetwear. And the overlap of the music and the clothing and I was like, wow, like a lot of these, this clothing has graphic expression on it. And then I realized, whoa, I think that's, I think I might be interested in that. So I started to play with the idea of starting a brand and almost thinking of it from this perspective of this would be a great portfolio piece to give to an agency. Should I ever go back in that route? And, you know, I really actually fell in love with the idea of having my own brand and uh, just kind of built it up. It took a long time to figure out, you know, what I was going to launch with and what designs would work, which ones I didn't actually like, which ones I thought would sell. And uh, eventually I launched a brand called Be Glitterati. And um, Be Glitterati was... It was like, so the word glitterati, it means like the leaders of society, like thought leaders, creative leaders. I was trying to be that and I was trying to get that across with with my um, designs. But there was this disconnect in that no one really knew what glitterati was. And I spent a lot of time trying to figure, trying to educate the audience on what the word meant. People didn't know how to pronounce it. Uh... The designs were okay, but there was something that wasn't right. And then I started to dig more into the core of what my interests were, which was creative expression. And I came up with this one shirt called, uh, that just had the, the phrase, Art Pays Me, on it. And at this point in time, I was like sort of frustrated with... I felt like the brand needed some kind of help. So I I sought help from my friend who had an agency at the time, uh, Bo. And uh, I met with him and his team. And we kind of brainstormed how we would, like what we could do to take Be Glitterati to the next level. And in those meetings kind of came up that a lot of what I was doing was rooted in this creative empowerment idea. And Bo said, look, man, honestly, have you ever considered changing the name to Art Pays Me? And I said, no, not really. However, I think you might be onto something. And he basically said, yeah, if you don't do it now, I'm taking the idea. Because here's another interesting thing is I was hashtagging a lot of my stuff with Art Pays Me, and we searched on Instagram for, you know, use of that hashtag, and I was the only one using it at that time, so we were really, like, on to something, so, you know, we bought the domain, I started, you know, prepping, you know, how I was going to transition Be Glitterati into Art Pays Me, and uh, the rest is history. So I'm not going to really go into too much more about Art Pays Me. Uh, You know, I would say other than once I got to the core of what I was really, my real story, I'd say, um, my business went to another level. It's not at the level that I want it to be at yet, but I really feel like it made a very big positive turn. Uh, I got some retail action, some retailers from uh, that period. I ended up uh, doing some shows with Atlantic Fashion Week. I've done my own solo show since then. And the, the brand, you know, when you're being authentic, see, Big, Big Glitterati was cool. It was me trying to make it some kind of statement, but it really wasn't me. I was a nerd growing up, and I still feel like a nerd. Be Glitterati was me trying to be the cool guy, saying, look, I'm not the nerd anymore, I'm cool now. But the reality is, I'm not that. I'm, I'm an artist trying to figure shit out, just like everybody else. I'm no cooler than anybody else. I'm just a regular dude who has some ideas and wants to share them. And art pays me 
um, really is about that. It's about me being a bit of a rebel and saying, yo, the society tells you art can't pay you, but I'm telling you society's wrong. Art can pay you. Uh, and me just digging, digging into that and wanting to share that idea with other people. And that's kind of what I'm doing with this podcast. That's what I want to do. I want to, I want to interview people who are like me, people who have different kinds of businesses in the creative field and dig, dig into how they are using their creativity to earn money and, you know, what are they doing? What mind shift did they have that got them to where they're at? Because I'm tired of seeing extremely talented people not be able to use that talent to earn money and seeing, you know, it's just sad to me. It's sad to me. So I want to help. I want to help people out. Uh, so I hope this was interesting to you. Let me know if, you know, what you think. Hit me up on at Art Pays Me on Twitter and Instagram. Um, my website is www.artpaysme.com. It's a little shaky, you know. I'm, I had some experience podcasting. I, I was on a podcast called Changing the Narrative. Um, but it's been months, so I'm feeling kind of rusty at this podcast and stuff. So anyway, hit me up. I hope you like this. Yo, before I go, I, I got to say thanks to my man Langy Beats for the intro and outro music. That's L-A-N-G-I-B-E-A-T-S. Hit him up on YouTube. See you next time.